Hello, I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor, JAMA Network Open. Welcome to JAMA Network Open Live. And I'm Angel Desai, JAMA from Schweinfella. Sorry about the late start. Uh, if you're following on live, uh, of course, you can send us your questions or comments on Twitter at Gemma Network Open, or you can comment in the comment box under the video in Facebook Live or on YouTube. And today, we are talking about a really interesting and relevant paper today, the assessment of sensitivity and specificity of patient-collected lower nasal specimens for severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 testing. And we've got the first two authors, Jonathan Altamarino and Prasanthi Govindarajan with us. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having us. Sure. Really glad you could join us. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves and why you did the study? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Jonathan Altamirano. I'm a research manager in the Department of Pediatrics here at Stanford, as well as in the Office of Faculty Development and Diversity. Um, I have been at the working in the School of Medicine for five years now. I've actually been at Stanford altogether for 10. I was a student here uh, and I did my undergraduate and my master's degree. And I am Prasanthi Govindrajan. I am Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine. I am also the Associate Vice Chair in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Stanford School of Medicine. And I am one of the study investigators for this study. Great. So this seems, you know, particularly relevant. Tell us what inspired you to do the study and what you did here. Great question. So, uh, you know, early in March, when we were talking about the pandemic here in Santa Clara County was one of the first counties to shut down for the pandemic. And Stanford was uh, very early, and, uh, you know, in the introduction of the test for COVID-19. You know, we had a homegrown tool that was FDA approved and we opened the doors for testing uh, as early as March uh, 4th. And uh, the clinical standard at that time uh, for obtaining specimens was the nasopharyngeal or the otopharyngeal uh, swabs. And, you know, for those who have had the nasopharyngeal swab, it's one of the most uncomfortable procedure. You know, I've had it twice myself. I've had a nosebleed once and just didn't want to go back for another one. That's how uncomfortable the nasopharyngeal swabs are. They are about six inches long, goes all the way to the back of the nose, you know, and then the healthcare provider will have to do a few circles to get the specimen and send it for testing. So the downside of these uh, techniques, even though they were the clinical standard at that time and had to be done, is that, you know, they are very uncomfortable. They can, you know, result in nosebleeds once in a while. And uh, they also can lead to a lot of coughing and sneezing, which leads to, you know, dispersion of the droplets and a high risk for healthcare providers doing these swaps. So our goal uh, for the study was to find a modified sampling technique, which was simple to perform, which could be done by the patient, uh, did not need, you know, to expose healthcare providers to respiratory droplets and increase the risk, uh, does not need a PPE uh, for the test to be done. And uh, so uh, we decided to go for the lower nasal swab technique. Uh, the only thing I wanted to jump in and add here as well is that um, if you've got the nasopharyngeal swab, you know, it's terrible, but if you only have to do it once, you know, and you're great and you're golden, then, you know, perfect. But, you know, let's say you need to do serial testing for whatever reason, you're immunocompromised, you have any of these other conditions that would require more regular testing. In that case, having a less invasive, more comfortable alternative is really, really crucial. Yep, absolutely. And I, th I think that's that's really important as we move to things like surveillance with returning to work and things like that. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, I fortunately only had to get swab once myself so far. The nasopharyngeal swab like I said, is uh, not at all enjoyable <laughs> to be euphemistic about it. Um, <laughs> and, and I think also just with it, what we know about the sensitivity of the swab already, uh, you know, I can tell you, you know, patients have absolute, you know, clear COVID syndromes with, you know, multiple negative swabs despite, uh, you know, intubation and sedation, um, you know, and, and, and you know, e e expert uh, collection. Um, so it's not just about technique. Um, but if people who are, you know, awake and alert are reluctant to get swabbed, um, or also just forget about whether or not we can do it a nicer way that doesn't hurt people. 
But one thing I one thing I liked about your study, uh, you know, trying to show is is you used a pretty high pretest probability uh, population. So basically, everyone who had already been positive before. Can you talk about that? That's exactly right. So we did want to, you know, we we were thinking of two phases of the study. In the first phase, we went for the pretest, you know, being high, uh, and and then bring those patients back, testing them, and then proving that there is diagnostic equivalence for the study. We do have a phase two, which is ongoing now, and we are trying to do this in 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 a population that's not tested. Uh, so we are doing this in the easy drive through population, uh, population that you know comes to stand for you know occupational health, and uh, and also do the research studies. So you know we just kind of planned it in a way you know for the first phase to prove the diagnostic equivalence and the second phase to validate the diagnostic equivalence. And that kind of explains why we did the, uh, the initial choice of the population for the testing. And now in this study, um, were patients instructed, given any instructions at all in terms of how to collect the sample? Because I would imagine that might uh, impact your yield. So they received sort of two instructional tools. One was a one-page instruction sheet showing you sort of exactly what you do, how far you need to go. Um, and, you know, the rest of the technique. They also had a short uh, GIF that they saw. And so we sent that to them before their appointment just so that, you know, they had the opportunity to review and to take a look and to really promise them that, you know, it's not as bad as, you know, what you've had before. You know, we had quite a few folks come back and be like, okay, so how bad is this? Really, be honest, please. <laughs> <laughs> And to kind of piggyback onto that, you know, uh, Jonathan made some excellent points. When patient came to the drive-through research tent, we tried not to give them instructions. We gave them the uh, the images, we gave them the video clips, but I did not walk them through the test. We did observe the technique, and we tried, you know, for most of the patients, I did not do the swab first. I made them do the swab first, and then followed that by our swab. Uh, so we also kind of tested indirectly the instructions that were given to them and the ability of the patients to use those instructions. And I noticed, and if you look at, we don't, unfortunately, uh, it wouldn't show well on the screen, so we don't, can't show it to the, um, the viewers, but in table two, it shows the concordance between the individual tests on all 30 subject participants. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting to me is the, the only discordance is with participant 12, where their self-swab was positive and the two physician swabs were negative, um, which to me, if anything, is the mistake we want to make at this point, right? That's exactly Absolutely. It. That's how we approach that in an emergency department. We would rather be, you know, oversensitive than kind of have false negatives. Yeah. What I thought was sort of interesting, I, maybe it was an unintended consequence, was I think 17% of patients also tested positive for other co-infections. Is that right? which I don't know if that's something sort of anecdotally seen or um, I've seen sort of varying, you know, numbers in some of this, um, some of the epidemiological studies that are out there. But I always think that's that's interesting um, to think about. So that's a great observation, Angel. I think JAMA also published uh, a research letter on the same, you know, co-infection rates, which came from Stanford for the emergency department. My male colleagues published it. And they found 20% co-infection rates in our population. And, you know, ours kind of, you know, uh, corroborated those findings uh, in, in a much later date. We do want to welcome uh, Jose Ricci and Michael uh, Demule, who have joined us. Apologies for any uh, pronunciation issues here. Uh, we're talking about self-swabs for COVID. Uh, one thing I was also interested about, if you could comment on, is I noticed uh, the, the other comparison here was oral pharyngeal swabs, not nasal pharyngeal swabs that you collected. Um, have those been validated against the nasal pharyngeal swabs? Are those as miserable as, a, as the nasal pharyngeals, et cetera? So I can maybe start and then I'll turn it over to Jonathan. You know, I, I did the otopharyngeal swabs uh, at the drive through and my observation is that they are less invasive and less uncomfortable than the nasopharyngeal swabs. You know, we do strep swabs all the time. You know, people gag a little bit, but it certainly isn't as uncomfortable as the deep, long swab that goes to the back of the throat, or I mean, I mean, to the back of the nasal cavity. 
So I would any day take my OP over an NP. Uh, that said, we also, you know, had other research reasons that Jonathan can maybe talk about on why we chose the OP over the NP. No, uh, absolutely. So at the very beginning of the study, we really wanted to get up and running as quickly as possible, given sort of the immediate need for sort of different types of testing, et cetera. And so, you know, the project was handed to us on a Friday. Uh, we started to get, you know, IRB and all sorts of approvals. We were able to get that, you know, in less than 24 hours. Uh, and as we were going back and forth, they were, you know, because nasopharyngeal swabs are more invasive, it would take more time in order for us to start to review this. However, oropharyngeal, which is another clinical standard for the detection of COVID, um, wouldn't require as extensive review because it's less invasive. And so, you know, that led us you know, get the project on Friday, get the approvals on Saturday, get the supplies on Sunday, start swabbing Monday. <laughs> yeah, I think the term for that's pragmatic now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, great. I mean, I think this is really fantastic. I think this really helps uh, move the needle, uh, especially as we're all hoping for, you know, kind of more widespread for surveillance uh, testing. Um, any final comments on your next steps? Uh so I would say, you know, the pilot results, as you see, is very promising. And, you know, we are working on the next phase, which is the validation phase. And we are also including asymptomatic patients in the validation phase, which is kind of a new population that we did not test in our phase one. So hopefully we will be able to share those results pretty soon. And, uh, you know, will hopefully help change the needle and the clinical standards on replacing nasopharyngeal swabs with the lower nasal swabs. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank JAMA for the opportunity to share these uh, results with the audience and through this publication and through various social media channels and through this interview. Um, and uh, I would also like to take this uh, moment to thank all of the co-authors of the study Dr. Bonnie Baldonado, who is the PI, my chairman, Dr. Andra Blomkans, Ben Kinski at Stanford, who developed the uh, test for COVID-19 at the Virology Lab, uh, my research staff, and all the residents and fellows who helped swab patients at the research tents. So, and then I'll turn it over to Jonathan, maybe for the last word on the Stanford CTRU. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I did want to mention just in terms of next steps, we have uh, collaborations that are ongoing at the Stanford COVID Clinical Trials Research Unit, or CTRU. Uh, so the CTRU is under the leadership of Dr. Maldonado and also Dr. Upinder Singh. Uh, and so they have a variety of ongoing and incoming studies, which, uh, you know, range from COVID community surveillance to clinical drug trials. And so those are all actively recruiting. And uh, if anybody is interested in sort of learning more, they can always reach out. Great. Well, really appreciate it. This is fantastic work and obviously very important once again. Uh, really glad you could, uh, you know, do the research, share it with us and uh, discuss with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right. So, Angel, what do we have next? All right. So, this is a temperature, humidity, and latitude analysis to estimate potential spread and seasonality of coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19. This is a really cool study by um, Sajadi and colleagues, and it was trying to examine the association of climate with the spread of COVID-19 infection. Um, and so this was a cohort study. It used climate data from 50 cities across the world. Um, sort of interesting. So they looked at eight cities that at that time, as of, I think it was as of March 10th, had had substantial uh, community transmission and 42 cities that had not had documented uh, substantial transmission. Um, figure two, I love this figure. It's like a beautiful, In terms of climate, they were sort of using temperature and humidity um, as some indicators. 
in cities that didn't have substantial uh, community transmission at the time, um, they were surprised because proximity didn't seem to actually make a difference. So I'm not explaining this that well, but if you look at figures three and four, it does actually demonstrate what I'm trying to show. It kind of compares, particularly figure four, um, has a comparison of sort of mean temperature and humidity between cities and countries with COVID-19 versus those that didn't have that much of it. Um, and so, you know, the things I would say about this is that, you know, one of the biggest limitations is, um, of course, as we've seen, reporting was variable between different cities and countries, um, particularly earlier on, so this may not capture um, everything that was going on. It may, rather, you know, climate may not have been the only factor, certainly wasn't the only factor uh, contributing to these findings. Um, and they also didn't account for things like public health interventions, travel, population density, demographics. But still, I do think it's sort of interesting to think about. Um, I think there's been a lot of sort of conversations or discussions around the role of temperature and, um, you know, things like that in terms of, and seasonality in terms of COVID, particularly as we move into summer, thinking kind of what's going to happen. I don't know that this doesn't necessarily answer that question, but it is sort of some interesting, um, a, a little extra interesting data. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was kind of my take that there's so many different pieces here. And the more I look at this, I feel like the more convinced I am that this is an element here. Um, and as you said, with figure two, if you look at the green band uh, with white circles, everything, obviously, but other things like international travel, luck, um, and this is one other feature. Um, and then it's always interesting to me because, uh, you know, when we've talked about weather and climate in this conversation, all, all, one of the questions, what about this other hemisphere where it's already been summer when this started? Um, and if you look at the temperature band, that's almost entirely in the ocean. Um, right. Yeah, it's true. So, so it certainly makes some sense. Um, and then some of the more specific comparisons, like figure three, which shows both compare, um, temperature and humidity, um, all the places the big cases are kind of right in that same little band. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And their definition of early cities was only 10 deaths reported, which is a pretty yeah. low threshold. Yeah. Um, Curious, I, you know, this is one of the things I'd love to see serial cross sections of, um, and it, it's pretty interesting. Um, do you want to uh, uh, welcome Akshay Shah has joined us? Welcome. We're talking about uh, climate and COVID, and we'll see what happens as uh, as the seasons change here. <laughs> yeah. Anything else you wanted to say on this one? I don't think so. It's very interesting. <laughs> really nice, nice, really nice figures. <laughs> Always, always love beautiful figures. Um, so speaking of interesting papers, uh, this is one, this is a topic that's right up my alley. So it's the prevalence of GI symptoms and fecal viral shedding in patients with COVID-19, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So I've talked about this a bunch. Uh, and I'll say, you know, my my big bias is, uh, is uh, papers that report studies that agree with or resonate with my clinical experience. Um, and I think that um, uh, what they did here is they basically looked at uh, all the papers that reported GI signs or symptoms. Um, here they, they looked at, I think it was 4,800 patients um, in 23 studies and another six preprints. Um, average age of 52, about one third were women. Um, and basically they found that 7% uh, of these studies reported diarrhea, 5% nausea and vomiting, which are actually pretty low compared to what I found or what I've seen in other places uh, or what I recall seeing, although I recognize my recall bias here. Um, uh, and also about a, a 15 to 20% uh, chance of elevated uh, liver enzymes and also 40% fecal RNA shedding. Um, yeah, you know, actually, yeah. actually. Yep. And we've talked about this before where it's a little unclear if, you know, that it, it seems to be that's more bare RNA than actually infected virus. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but we, cer we certainly don't know. One thing I will say that I think is missing here is they don't talk about um, abdominal pain or yeah. flank pain. Um, and that's something I've seen reported about 25%. Um, in the studies that mention it, and I'd say that probably uh, resonates with my experience, but I'd also say I've had some memorable, memorable patients early on that, that had predominantly abdominal pain. And well, I remember one of the first patients you'd met, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I remember one of the first patients you had mentioned actually had come in with abdominal pain. Um, so, I mean, it's an anecdote, but it, it stuck with me too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, I, so, you know, I recognize my own anchoring bias and, you know, as I'm thinking back more recently, I, I think I have fewer patients with just predominantly, uh, we were with more isolated abdominal symptoms. Um, 
Uh, but that's certainly something we're seeing and something we've seen in some of the other reporting. I think I saw a paper last week, it was like 24% of of overall patients. And then they report some of the interesting limitations. Uh, you know, basically, uh, if you're not asking these questions, if you're not reporting these questions, it's not going to make a domain analysis. And something I hadn't thought of before is if you have a patient with fairly severe respiratory symptoms, they may not even notice or tell anyone that they're nausea because they feel so miserable from their breathing or their coughing or whatever it is. Uh, so it can be easy to, I, I think, overlook secondary symptoms. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, and one of the other things that I thought was just so interesting was I think they had said um, that they were four, they had looked at 1,400 records or something, and that to me just like speaks to how much has been published in such a short amount of time. Um, yeah. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's you know, as we were just talking about uh, with, with the authors earlier, uh, you know, doing things like figuring out uh, legitimate workarounds to speed up IRB approvals, like doing oral swabs instead of nasal swabs makes a ton of sense. And, uh, you know, the things we've been doing to try to um, uh, get er good early research out, uh, try to do it carefully. There have been some uh, uh, prominent um, uh, retractions and, and corrections, I think. Uh, fortunately, uh, I don't think we've had to do any of those <laughs> yet. Um, but, uh, but I think that's, uh, you know, uh, more, more, I'd like to think it's care, but I would, I appreciate that a lot of it's probably luck. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, I think that's all we have for today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, of course, uh, you can get these papers and more at jaminetworkopen.com, where everything is free, uh, and get new papers every weekday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And join us next week, I believe that's June 23rd, uh, at 3 p.m. Central Time for another uh, JNO Live. Um, and of course, stay safe. Thanks.